That day, either because it was such a great holiday or simply because he wanted to divert a sick man, he had taken off the glove he usually wore on his left hand, the one pressing against the side of the door, and revealed to the fascinated sufferer not only an entire lack of fourth and fifth fingers, but also a naked girl with cinnabar nipples and indigo delta, charmingly tattooed on the back of his crippled hand, its index and middle digit making her legs while his wrist bore her flower-crowned head. Oh, delicious, reclining against the woodwork like some sly fairy. I asked him to tell Mary Law I would stay in bed all day and would get in touch with my daughter sometime tomorrow if I felt probably Polynesian. He noticed the direction of my gaze and made her right hip twitch amorously. Okie dokie, Big Frank sang out, slapped the jam and whistling, carried my message away and I went on drinking. And by morning the fever was gone. And although I was as limp as a toad, I put on the purple dressing gown over my maize yellow pyjamas and walked over to the office telephone. Everything was fine? A bright voice informed me that, yes, everything was fine. My daughter had checked out the day before, around two. Her uncle, Mr. Gustav, had called for her with a cocker spaniel pup and a smile for everyone and a black caddy lack and had paid Dolly's bill in cash and told them to tell me I should not worry and keep warm they were at Grandpa's ranch, as agreed. Elphinstone was, and I hope still is, a very cute little town. It was spread like a maquette, you know, with its neat green wool trees and red-roofed houses over the valley floor, and I think I have alluded earlier to its model school and temple and spacious rectangular blocks, some of which were, curiously enough, just unconventional pastures with a mule or a unicorn grazing in the young July morning mist. Very amusing. At one gravel-groaning sharp turn I sideswiped a parked car but said to myself telestically and telepathically, I hoped to its gesticulating owner, that I would return later. Address bird school, bird, new bird. The gin kept my heart alive but amazed my brain. And after some lapses and losses common to dream sequences, I found myself in the reception room trying to beat up the doctor and roaring at people under chairs and clamouring for Mary, who luckily for her was not there. Rough hands plucked at my dressing gown, ripping off a pocket, and somehow I seemed to have been sitting on a bald, brown-headed patient whom I had had mistaken for Dr. Blue, and who eventually stood up, remarking with a preposterous accent, Now who is neurotic, I ask? And then a gaunt, unsmiling nurse presented me with seven beautiful, beautiful books and the exquisitely folded tartan lap robe and demanded a receipt. And in the sudden silence I became aware of a policeman in the hallway, to whom my fellow motorist was pointing me out, and I meekly signed the very symbolic receipt, thus surrendering my Lolita to all those apes. But what else could I do? One simple and stark thought stood out, and this was, freedom for the moment is everything. One false move, and I might have been made to explain a life of crime. So I simulated a coming out of a daze. To my fellow motorist, I paid what he thought was fair. To Dr. Blue, who by then was stroking my hand, I spoke in tears of the liquor I bolstered too freely a tricky but not necessarily diseased heart with. To the hospital in general I apologised with a flourish that almost bowled me over, adding, however, that I was not on particularly good terms with the rest of the Humbert clan. To myself I whispered that I still had my gun and was still a free man, free to trace the fugitive, free to destroy my brother.' 